it's only going downhill from here. Hello, everyone. I am ready. Thank you for coming to my talk. Thank you for picking me over, Frank. Um, I'm sure he'll appreciate that. I'm glad to be here in Long Island. Well, I live here. Um, so I'm happy to be at this event. I'm always happy to be a part of it. I love it. So today, uh, I am going to talk about something. And I am Anatoly Shashkin, if anybody knows or doesn't know. Also known as Das Nostalgic in some dark corners of the internet. So let's get to the weird and wonderful world of my bad alliteration of French computer games. Why France? Well, for me personally, uh, I like France. I like French culture, French food. I took several years of French in high school, but that was a long time ago and I forgot all of it. So today I will mangle every French word I can. And I apologize in advance. Um, but I also think that French have an interesting culture of uh, early computer games that sort of get overlooked often. Um, we don't look, at least most people don't look at France as sort of the, the land of uh, video games. Today, of course, they're popular, but people don't talk about the old ones too much. So let's see. Let's go back to 1985, a very important year in uh, French computing history. Um, a special program gets started called Informatique pour tout, um, computing for everyone. And part of that program was installing over 120,000 computers in French schools. French were always on the cusp of uh, technology. They had the Minitel, if anybody knows. It's all very interesting stuff. Um, Apple lost a contract last second, and instead, um, they ended up with the Thomson microcomputers. Not very popular anywhere else, but they're, you know, they're decent micros. And um, uh, the program had a fault in it because it did not account for training any personnel to teach the computers to children. And as a result, it was soon abandoned. However, that exposed a lot of French children to computing and uh, you know, started up their interest in that. Um, so why some French games are so weird? Let's look at the, some of the influences. We're still at that point in time, uh, our um, in the midst of French comic boom. It's still going, it's going very strong. Everybody's reading them, all the kids are reading them, all the adults are reading them. And it's a pretty wide array of topics. Like we have the wacky comedy stuff. We have creepy slash sexy sci-fi. I don't know what that is. Um, historical adventures, um, grisly horror. Um, all of that, you know, is permeates the culture. And a lot of the French games are very comic book inspired. Uh, another big influence is a magazine called Metal Orlan. Just an anthology magazine that publishes movie reviews. We'll see Blade Runner. I wonder what review they gave that. Uh, and uh, they publish everything, reviews, short stories, comic series by acclaimed artist, now acclaimed artist, um, on a variety of topics, as you can see. Um, and if that sounds familiar, uh, this is where Heavy Metal magazine came from because it originally literally was an adaptation of this magazine and published translated versions of those comics. Uh, on the home market, you have some computers creeping into every average homes like the Amstrad CPC. Um, not, a particular, um, not a particularly popular machine, um, sort of like a Spectrum uh, kind of thing, a bit more powerful, but France love those machines, about a third of all the sales throughout the entire Europe account for France. Um, of course, for people who could afford it, 16-bit era, the Amiga and the Atari ST to compete in 16-bit machines with great graphics and in case of Amiga, great sound. Don't tell anyone on said that. Um, and of course, once those machines failed to uh, modernize, and the IBM PC sort of rose from being a machine for spreadsheets. Uh, IBM PC and MS-DOS are taking over. Today, unusually for myself, I'm going to be covering the variety of platforms, so every time I'm going to show footage from some game or a shot in the bottom right corner, you'll see the indication of the platform. So, <laughs> let's get to it. Uh, now we're just going to take a look at a bunch of 
wonderful and weird French stuff. Let's start with something familiar. Ubisoft, right? Everybody knows what that is. Or as it was known back in the day, Ubisoft. Um, very 80s. Not a secret to most people, I think, is their first game a zombie. Uh, originally for Amstrad CPC, you see the Amiga version here. About four people uh, who are locked down in the mall to fight off an army of flesh-eating reanimated corpses, if that sounds familiar. It's, of course, an adaptation, an unofficial adaptation of George Romero's 1978 classic Dawn of the Dead, for which the game didn't only take its poster and the story and just about everything, really, but also stole the title. It was called Zombie in Italy and some other territories. Right? Okay, well... Ubisoft is not ashamed of this. It's like a cute thing in history, right? They have only even recently um, sort of honored it with a Zombie U game, right? I think. I didn't play it, uh, but interesting. So what did they follow up, follow it up with? Um, there's another game, Early Mong. Um, all right. Looking wolfy kind of thing, the title. Oh, but guess what? It's also ripped off from a movie. Um, also the title as well as the poster. Well, what movie could that possibly be? Uh, that is, of course a French title for Joe Dante's classic, The Howling. Um, the game itself follows almost the same standard as uh, Zombie. Uh, however, despite ripping off the title and the poster and the theme, it doesn't actually follow the story of The Howling. It's, it's more of its own thing. So they're improving, right? So maybe, maybe they have something that, you know, more original, right? They're going the right direction. Uh, oh, no, Ubisoft. Um, uh, yeah, that happened. Uh, I also want to point out that Ubisoft were very prolific. In just the tail end of 86 and the end of 88, uh, they have more than 20 titles. Um, fairly unusual for the time. Um, I was going through this, and I saw this one recently that I didn't know anything about. It didn't uh, come out in English. Uh, it's called Manhattan 95, right? And... For, to me, at the first glance, it looked fairly generic. Like, this didn't really look like it's ripping anything off. It looked like an amalgamation of things, like, 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 a, like, a, like a B or C grade, or Z grade, uh, 80s action flick, right? The, you see the Manhattan, right? This might be like something off a of Stallone, uh, there's a mullet, right? It looks generic enough. So it did look that way until I started up the game, and I'm going to let this roll. This is fairly long, but I just want you all to take it in, because and see if I had, if you're gonna have the same reaction as I did. the entire thing. I mean, you'd say so, but... I'm actually quite impressed by, by the amount of effort that went into copying this. I don't know how they did it back in the day. No, I mean like uh, technically, like how did they trace it? Because, and I did compare it, it's very, very close. Oh yeah, and that too. Um, yeah, so, I don't think I have to point out, but I will. <laughs> this game, extreme similarity to John Carpenter's 1981 classic, Escape from New York. And, and you think, all right, well at least they didn't rip the title off this time, right? Except in France it was called New York 1997. <laughs> all right, Ubisoft, good. But they did improve over time, as we all know, right? Uh, and they also published other titles. And this is a series of games called BAT, Bureau of Astral uh, Troubleshooters. Uh, some of my favorite box art, actually, on this. This is gorgeous to me. 
And these are sort of like open world RPG adventures where you have a mission and you sort of go around places, you talk to people, you, um, hunting down your targets. I mean, not too weird, right? And it's all comic booky. The panels actually change as you go along. The layout changes. It's very, uh, very ambitious. The second game adds multiple planets and 3D vehicle sections. And this doesn't sound too weird, right? Except the agent that you play isn't capable of letting you know when he's hungry or hurt or when he doesn't understand somebody or literally just about anything. So in both of those games, you have a, a wrist computer which you actually just have to program. To, to do all of those things uh, in the first game via actual commands, in the second game via pictograms. I, I don't know why, just because? That French. There's going to be a lot of that today. Um, let's move on to um, uh, infogrames. Uh, along with Ubisoft, these are the only two companies that are still around, uh, out of all I'm going to mention. Um, today, of course, we know it as Atari. Um, back in the day, uh, they're famous for games like Alone in the Dark, of course, a classic. You can play it on the third floor. It's being demoed. Uh, great game. Not too weird. Very ambitious. Uh, one of my favorite games of all time. It's cool. Uh, but they do have one, one really, really weird game. Uh, that game is Eternum, which is currently available on both GOG and Steam, surprisingly. And it's hard to describe what it is, uh, but it's an adventure game. It's going to turn into an adventure game. It starts off as a 3D uh, uh, thing. Uh, it's a combination of cartoon graphics, lots of animation uh, that takes place on a planet where each section is its own theme. Think Westworld. Uh, there's like a medieval castle, but the whole game is presented in a theater setting. Uh, um, <laughs> and they're constantly break the fourth wall as they're talking to you as if you were making a movie. Um, there's a lot of slapstick, uh, as you could tell, and there's like one island that the entire setting is a reenactment of a French Revolution. Um, if that sounds weird, it's not even the tip of, it's not even like, I'm not even covering most of it. There's a great review of that uh, by Ross's Gaming Dungeon on YouTube. Take a look at it, if you're interested. Oh yeah, stuff like this happens in that game. Um, yes. So, yeah, those kind of things. That's uh, infogrames for you. Let's move on to, now we're getting to the big names. Ario, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's not Ario. Informatique is uh, one of the oldest um, French video game companies, established in 1983, along with infogrames and a couple of others. And um, to begin with, they were very successful. They were not really making weird games. It was like, they sort of did small games that were all over the place. They were fairly successful. If anybody ever played Bubble Ghost, on the Game Boy, it's one of theirs, interesting concept, where you like a little ghost that blows a bubble, and you can't touch the walls, it's really cute. Um, but despite their success, they for some reason were having financial trouble. So in 1987, they sell to Infogrames. Um, but that just feels like they were just waiting for the moment to get the money in, because they instantly establish a label called Exos to make games. And while under that label, they say that Exos is not a company, Exos is a deity, a god, and uh, Exos just beams the games through the designers um, into, into being. Uh, they're just doing his bidding, they're just merely the vessels. Um, and uh, each time they released a new game, they publicly sacrificed one of the machines the game was developed on. Like you'll see here. Uh, oh boy. Very much so. Oh yeah. There's like a half hour long video of this on YouTube. Check it out. Oh yeah. So what games did they make? Well, their first title, they started strong right out of the gate, is a game called Captain Blood. A very successful game where the story is you are Bob Morlock, the programmer who works on a game called Captain Blood, a space trading sim. Lightning strikes and you are transported into the world of your own creation where eight clones are made of you and they're draining the life out of you. And now you pilot the ship called the Ark and uh, beam probes down to the surfaces of the planets using a genetically modified dolphin. Um, to talk to alien species using pictograms. Actually, the entire game, not the entire game, but the big part of the game is talking to different alien species using pictograms, where each pictogram stands up for a word, like you see here, me, no, like you. 
Um, and each of the alien races actually has a different dialect, like some talk only backwards, some always lie. Um, that's a game. Uh, big success, very French. Uh, they move on to this thing called Cult. It's an adventure game, I think, um, because playing it is like, I don't know, you'll see, this is literally the very beginning of the game, and trust me, it doesn't get any less weird from there. Um, the only thing I can talk, tell about it is um, I'm usually against renaming uh, games in other territories, unless it's like something very specific, but the game is called Cult originally, and it's one of the few cases where in, when it m got translated for the US, it got a better title because over here it's called Chamber of the Psy Mutant Priestess. <laughs> yeah, that's better. That's better. Great title. <laughs> Love it. Um, Purple Saturn Day. Well, um, Epix was uh, Exos's publisher in the States, and if you know anything about Epix early on, they were famous for sports games, winter games, summer games, whatever games, however many games they, they made. So. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, Purple Saturn Day is what happens when you ask a bunch of weird French people to make you one of those games. What kind of competitions were there in the Purple Saturn Day? Um, this? Okay, right. Um, well, what eventually happens is uh, Exos people um, have some kind of a falling out with Infogrames, so they leave and they instantly set up Cryo Interactive Entertainment, where they just sort of carry on. Their first title, now it takes them two years to get there, is a very ambitious title, very good game actually. Um, it's Dune. 1992's Dune, uh, a mix of um, adventure and strategy. It's a strategy game that controls like an adventure game. Uh, very stylistically inspired by the David Lynch's adaptation of the book. Uh, it was cancelled twice by Virgin, who stopped giving them money and said stop working on it, but they kept working on it. So eventually when they brought the finished Game 2 version, they were like, oh, well, might as well release it. And this is the reason the strategy game that came out half a year later is called Dune 2. It wasn't supposed to be. Um, Cryo just beat uh, Westwood to the punch. And Virgin had the license for, for Dune, so they published both. Um, yeah. Uh, great stuff. Uh, an amazing game, actually. A very hard, beautiful presentation. Uh, this is like sort of to me the quintessential French game. Innovative in gameplay, uh, you can actually play it, which is actually not the case for most of the games I'm going to be covering here. So don't, don't get too excited. Um, but yeah, beautiful game. And so they follow the suit. Same year because of the uh, Dune's development, they also released KGB, a detective adventure game with a time rewind mechanic. Um, set in a, still to this day, a very unusual setting of the Soviet Union. Cool. Uh, of course, uh, pre-rendered 3D racing game, uh, Mega Race, just a simple racy shooty thing, just fun. No big concepts, except for more of a technology uh, involved. This is also one of the games that you can try on the third floor. Um, the only thing about it, uh, it couldn't just be straightforward, of course. Uh, the story is, you don't actually race, you're in a virtual reality, but the virtual reality is also on a TV show, and you periodically get interrupted by the, everyone's favorite host, Lance Boyle presented uh, in amazingly cheesy full motion video. It's worth it. Um, Lost Eden, another strategy adventure blend that takes place in a world where humans coexist with dinosaurs. Um, Commander Blood, they sequelized uh, their most famous early title. Now, it's, some years have passed. It's now the 90s, it's not the 80s anymore. How do you update a really weird game that was hailed for being weird originally, even when it came out. This is how. I'm just gonna let it play for a bit. I could do this all day. It's actually like five minutes recorded. There's some gameplay too, but I, I, I urge you to look it up. It's, um, it's, it's something. Oh yeah. <laughs> Everybody's enjoying it in this game. It's, uh, it's good. So they also did a combination of RPG and adventure in the Dragon Lore series. They have historical series, Versailles. Um, they have like sort of historical fantasy and Atlantis series. They, um, they even made games that they th thought were weird. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, 
or weird first-person shooters that take place in uh, Paris catacombs. Nobody knows this game exists, by the way. There's no listing for it anywhere. Um, uh, and of course, stuff like later on, they went on to do stuff like The Devil Inside, which is, you know, your usual um, survival horror, shooty, zombie in a mansion thing. You'd think what would be so special about it. But no, this also takes place inside a reality TV show. And you're periodically interrupted by a host, as long as you can see it here. But there are camera crews inside the mansion. And you have to plan your kills to look better, uh, to score more points than your opponents. Great stuff. Uh, now let's move on to Cobra Soft. Um, Nothing particularly weird about them. I just really admire this company's uh, ambition. And you'll see why. They're famous for their murder series. Um, uh, first one is uh, Meurtre à grande vitesse, a sort of a murder on a high-speed train. All right. Then we move on to Murder in the Atlantic. All right. So, train, boat. Uh, Meurtre en Syrie, serial murders, but it takes place on an island. Uh, then we will, of course, move on to Venice. And does anyone want to guess where does the series go next? No. There we go, yes. I, by the way, love this artwork. It's amazing. Um, yeah. I think more series should do this. I'm still bummed out that Leisure Suit Larry didn't go into space. Um, yeah. So Merrill's. Uh, fairly well-known company, uh, obviously named after Silmarillion. Um, Silmarillion? I don't know. Not big on fantasy. Um, but, so they started off, right off the bat, they started off with this game called Mad Show, another concept of a, of a TV show where um, everybody competes with different alien races. Uh, just essentially a collection of mini-games that looks like this. All right. Um, but later on, they, um, they did some very interesting experiments. Like, for example, one of my favorite games of theirs is Transarctica. I love this artwork of a train. It's, it's beautiful. However, this is not an original artwork. It's licensed. It's been on some metal albums. And you can even buy, to this day, buy a print of it uh, at the artist's website. It's, it's a great artwork. I love it. Um, but in this game, Transarctica, you are uh, a conductor of a train in a sort of post-apocalypse where everything is covered in snow. There is no sunlight. And you... Um, you uh, sort of travel the entire world as uh, train tracks. You manage your... You, I'm going to get to that. Uh, you, you, you get to manage your, your cars and you get to restock at towns and there's battles like sort of Sid, Meier, uh, Sid Meier's Pirates style. Uh, also open world game. Incredibly hard to play, but beautiful presentation. And as you have said, you say, but Anatoly, that sounds a lot like Snowpiercer. Is this based on the same property? And I'm going to say no, because believe it or not, uh, it's not what came first, but France in the 70s, there's two different franchises that take place on trains in uh, um, snow-covered post-apocalypse. And uh, they are unrelated to each other, and the Snowpiercer is based on the other one. Um, yeah, that happened. Um, uh, oh yeah, and the, the very French uh, touch in order to quit the game, you gotta commit suicide. And then, I don't have the next screen, but literally after you do it, before it drops you into dust, it's like sad, sad music plays and like the entire screen, just a screen, a text appears where it's like, uh, everybody has died, you failed everyone, and uh, just life is terrible, and why did you do this, and you're, you're an awful person, and you gave up, and that's, uh, yeah, uh, just that. Also, Robinson's Requiem, that is a pretty amazing game. Uh, just on the technology side, this is a survival game. You crash land on a planet, uh, on an uh, alien planet, and you get to manage everything from what clothes you wear to, uh, to what food you eat. You, know, you get to explore which, uh, which flora and fauna of this planet will not kill you. Um, very involved, you can um, amputate your own limb if you have to. Uh, it's, it's really good. And it's like all 3D vox, early voxel graphics where voxels aren't uh, cubes, but they're just flat surfaces. It gets a bit confusing, but good effort. Um, that itself would have been good enough, right? But not for France. Um, the story of the game is you are actually part of a class called the Robinsons, who are those interstellar explorers. But all of you, for some reason, crash land on this one planet um, and go crazy, except for you. All of you are named after a famous scientist or philosopher with a, na with a number at the end. And every night you see uh, telepathic dreams from the only girl 
in your class who is the only one who's not named after a philosopher or a scientist? Like, they couldn't find one? I don't know. Really dumb. Uh, but yeah, and, oh, and they're werewolves. And, and were centaurs. Uh, don't have a screenshot. Um, yeah, there's even a sequel to this game. So, uh, yeah, that happened. But, of course, Silmarils actually are fairly prolific. They have different series, but I just wanted to showcase one thing that they were definitely known for is their art. This is a pretty straightforward, their Ishar series. Um, it's a sort of dungeon crawly kind of RPG thing. Nothing particularly special about it except the art. They improve with every game. All their games are famous for, for, for beautiful, beautiful 2D artwork. Great stuff. Um, almost none of their games are worth playing though, but, but they sure look great. Cocktail Vision. All right, couldn't wait to get to them. That's one of my favorite companies like ever. Um, first of all, I just love the name of the company. I think it's a genius name. Um, and uh, they also started fairly early on and they did a lot of adaptations of French comics, Lucky Luke, Blueberry, what have you. Um, but also early on, they were joined by Muriel Chami a young engineer uh, who is often called the Roberta Williams of France. And while I understand why that's there, uh, I don't think the comparison is fair to either of them. Um, their works are very different. Muriel Tremie herself is a descendant of Caribbean slaves from the island of Martinique. And that is the theme that she, inspired by adventure game Maniac Mansion, she just wanted to make her own adventure game. Uh, she tackled that theme head on right away uh, with the title Muilo, uh, Mewilo, um, where you are an explorer of different islands in the Caribbean and like a soul, a spirit of an old slave owner comes back to haunt people and you sort of get to explore the various um, settlements and see how time affected them and stuff. It's pretty cool stuff. And this, her second game, Freedom, Rebels in Darkness, is a cinemaware style um, action adventure where you're a slave on the Martinique who is tasked with um, setting up a rebellion and you go around collecting your forces, avoiding guard dogs and uh, uh, guards and other unsavory characters. Um, 1988, pretty cool. Um, but Muriel Tremie's works are very diverse because at the same time as this, she was also doing erotic games like uh, Emmanuel, or Geisha. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, this it's a presentation about French games, so a, a given. Um, fascination, um, an erotic game with a very strong female protagonist. Um, she also co-created Addy series of educational games, also known as Addy Boo. There's like a ton of those games that's been around since the 80s, yes sir. Yes, I've got to get to that. Uh, yeah, I have, like, some of the... I think I still have some of the um, games of it on PC. Like, they were in, like, late 90s, early 2000s. Yes, but they started in the 80s. There's so many games in this series uh, because, notoriously, educational games are not very well documented. I don't know how many there are. But this series outlived both Cocktail Vision and, like, every company that owned it since. Uh, in fact, one of the last ones I could find was from 2009 on the Wii U. It's still going. Somebody owns it. Um, but of course, uh, what are, most people know Meryl Tremie for is the Goblin series of games that she co-created with a French artist and animator, Pierre Guillaud, where you control multiple goblins with different abilities to solve nonsensical puzzles. The uh, amount of eyes in the title decreases as the amount of protagonists decreases as well, but games actually become better. Um, there's three games in this series, but... Um, to be honest with you, uh, Guillaud's and Tremie's magnum opus is actually Woodruff and the Schnibble of Azimuth. Amazing title. Um, in America, it was retitled The Bizarre Adventures of Woodruff and the Schnibble, which I don't think helps much. But it's this big CD-ROM adventure game. Uh, unlike Goblins, you can walk around. You don't have to solve puzzles in a particular section. It has full voiceovers. Um, this is this guy's actually called GF Sebastian in the, in the English version, surprisingly, where they literally so they can have a line. Where can I find this GF Sebastian in the game? Um, but it's a 
the best of both worlds because it has tons of animations in Pierre Guillaume style. They're really goofy, really wacky, really everything. But the theme of the game is about colonialism because it takes place in the world which, uh, of uh, native uh, people um, called the Buzooks who have been uh, enslaved by humans and now they're like not even second, like third class uh, uh, citizens uh, that everybody looks down upon and everything's been taken away from them including like their alphabet and their food. Um, really cool stuff actually. It's wacky and goofy and weirdly serious. Um, yeah, worth playing, very frustrating but like so frustrating that the manual actually flat out just has some solutions for the puzzles in it but trust me it's actually worth it. Um, but even without Muriel Trami's involvement, Cocktail Vision <laughs> didn't make games any less weird. Let's see, this game called Inca, right? You'd think it's some historical stuff, but this, uh, Ameri this is American box art, which is a bit more explicit about the concepts of the game that gives something away. Uh, is there a galleon in space? What? All right, so let's just, let's just uh, let the game run and let's see what, uh, what happens. Ura cocha teitan ninchis, papanchis, o guancuna, arinta tia yaptingo que yaptan chispi, paisca a charaña, intinchis, papanchis, manamia charcan charinca, ruparinca, guata y guata y taguantin suyunchis, inca cuna, grimas yanku, y matarachcha jamunca, son coininta, tumiwan, mi richarichacum, mucho y cara y munca, yaptan chispi, al papis catatamunca, son cayo juruna cuna, I actually personally feel this is really cool for 92. But so far so good, right? It's like, all right. Historical, right? You get some actual language. Very cool presentation. All right, right. So I guess nothing weird will happen. Oh, what? I'm with this guy. Uh, see, I the first like 10 pages of the manual explain what this is. I actually read them and I know what happens, what it's meant to symbolize. It doesn't help. <laughs> it's great. Something I only learned very recently about cocktail vision is though, I knew at different points in time there were different companies. In fact, they sort of separated their tasks by different offices. Uh, cocktail vision itself um, were the art and designers and Tomahawk were people who published things and MDO was a, was a separate company, it was just programmers and like one of the composers. But only recently I learned that while, so the designers and the artists, Cocktail Vision, were in Paris, the programmers were all the way in Bordeaux. And um, it's like on the opposite ends of the country. Um, that's 360 miles away um, in the 80s, which I think explains a lot about their games. Uh, however, in 1993, Cocktail Vision was bought by Sierra. Uh, maybe as you have covered, they're actually pioneers in uh, many a technology, like 3D rendering, uh, but Sierra bought them for their full motion video uh, tech, which they used to make Phantasmagoria. Um, but yeah, Cocktail Vision weren't the only ones on the, on the technological cusp, like this is the game from Lori Cells, game on only use CGI graphics and PC speaker. This is on the PC speaker. Get ready for Mac 3. Not bad, I'd say, right? Pretty good. French were always on the cusp of like a lot of technological breakthroughs. Uh, or like this company, uh, Lancor. Um, they're actually famous for their detective adventure games, uh, Mortville Manor, uh, Melopedia Island, and the Black Sack. Nobody knows this one because this one didn't sell. But um, 
these are all sort of like adventures that take place in real time. You get characters, they're detective adventures, murder mysteries, where characters move and you get to talk to them, you get to question them. Uh, the first two games used speech synthesis to voice all the dialogue in the games. What did that sound like? Let's see the PC version of the uh, uh, first title. Yeah, it sounds a bit muffled, but you think about it, it's the year is 1988, you have an IBM PC, which mostly is used for spreadsheets and word processing at the time. This is pretty good, and high-res graphics too, so this is pretty impressive stuff. Yeah, no, pretty cool. But wait, there's more, right? So I was concentrating on um, really weird ones, but of course there's all those games that, that everybody knows, or at least a lot of people know. Um, um, another World, of course, also another game that you can try upstairs, but you can play it on anything these days, the 20th anniversary edition. You can play it on Switch, I think, uh, the most recent release. Great game. Uh, great game. Flashback, of course. Uh, Rayman, that's when Ubisoft found their success in 95 and they stopped ripping people off. Um, uh, Little Big Adventure series, uh, this is the second game here. Great stuff. Uh, Heart of Darkness, nobody knows that one, but it's a great game from the guy who made Another World um, worth playing on PlayStation and Windows. Amazing game. Uh, really hard. It is really hard. It, if you thought Another World was hard, this game is like five times harder. Omicron, the Nomad Soul, first David Cage's game. I, I don't like David Cage or his games, but this is like a quintessential French game. First of all, Bowie is in it, and you go to a bunch of his concerts, but the whole premise of the game that you are the player uh, inhabiting uh, you're the soul, the traveling soul that inhabits every character, which when they die, uh, gets passed on to the first person who discovers your dead body. And that's how the game goes on. It wants to be an open world adventure, first person shooter, a driving game, a fighting game. It fails at all of those things, but you can't really, uh, but Bowie. Uh, Bowie at the time when nobody really cared about Bowie either. So it's like, it's like a post lost highway, but pre the new generation of discovery. So, you know, interesting. Uh, original songs too. Um, uh, Beyond Good and Evil, great game, right? Um, so, uh, um, yeah, uh, that's a great game. If actually, if anybody didn't play this, it's worth it. This is like one very modern, because it's recent, right? And it's very playable and very French. It, it, it retains a lot of that French touch, despite uh, sort of doing away with uh, all like the French weirdness that uh, uh, they eventually gave up on because they figured out the games might sell. Um, uh, so why am I talking about this? Well, it's obviously it's because I like French games, right? So I love them. I love those weird experiments and everything. And I would like France to be more recognized as a sort of a place of early computing gaming history. However, I'm also talking about this because I think um, I find that often the retro gaming history discussion centers almost exclusively on either American output or the Japanese output. And I'm glad that it's happening. I'm glad that we live in a world where everybody knows that Super Mario Bros. 2 is Doki Doki Panic. Um, however, not a lot of this stuff gets brought up. And also, a lot of the stuff gets lost. And people from those regions, because they're following the same conventions, like even people in France talk about American and Japanese games. Nobody really talks about French games, sadly. Um, a lot of the games I showed did have English localization. That was another thing. Like some of them, like Goblins, of course, are uh, very well remembered by, by many. But yeah, like these games I showed, they're not even that obscure because they have English uh, translations. So the spread is wider than the things. There, there are games from other regions, like Spanish games. Most of the Spanish games have no English localizations, and they're like almost gone. So like, you know, we still haven't discovered everything. We lost so much. And the uh, prime example of this is just earlier this year on Twitter, this person posted up, did you know that there was a, a, a game on the music CD of, in, of this artist, uh, Etienne Dao, in 1996? I did not know that, so I bought it. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, it says like in a very, very tiny thing at the bottom, uh, it, it says uh, a game compatible with Windows 95, which is not a lie, but it's a DOS game. Great. Um, but yeah, I'll also, he's a very recognized artist, like a really interesting thing. I listened to it and <laughs> not my thing, but I played the game and it's an autobiographical game um, where you play Zetian as he, uh, and go through his childhood and um, youth 
and um, apparently, I don't know how autobiographical this is, but uh, in the game, a mermaid appears to you and, uh, and uh, tells you that she is about to teach you the secrets uh, of life's little pleasures. And the pleasures are as follows, um, eating some honey, uh, cutting the school to go swimming, um, underage drinking, um, finding love. And at the end of the game, you get to rediscover your childhood innocence through a very heavy-handed metaphor. Um, is, it, is it good? I mean, no, but literally, like, nobody knew this existed. This, uh, uh, I had to order from uh, French eBay. Um, because nobody talks about it, and it just took this one person being like, hey. And by the way, this game is now playable on the Internet Archive and everything, so you can check it out for yourself. Um, it's called Eden Dio. Uh, it's in French, but... You know, um, so yeah, this is this is the weird and wonderful world of French games, and who knows how many treasures there are. And I would uh, like to encourage everybody to dig in, to look online, talk to people if you have French friends, or just people from other regions. Like, there's plenty of Spanish games out there that nobody talks about, and everything. So yeah, uh, I would like to uh, credit um, this book, Epopee. Uh, published by Hardcore Gaming 101, uh, which is a collection of interviews, but with a great intro. And it helped me um, a lot in preparation of this talk, uh, as well as website Moby Games, from which all the screenshots and artwork came from that weren't for DAS. Um, and that's me. I'm Anatoly Shashkin. You can find me at Das Nostalgic on Twitter, Das Nostalgic on YouTube, dasnostalgia.com, and uh, Das Nostalgia on Facebook. Well, thank you all for coming and for staying and for asking questions. I hope you enjoyed my talk. I, ho I hope it was entertaining. Thank you. Thanks so much. You're welcome. And some of those games are available to play. Just a handful, not too many, but there's Goblins, there's Mega Race, there's...